upper form. It suits you. Oh, no. Lynn, Looks Lynn like knows. your signature. <laughs> Paula knows. Oh, Paula's seen me at job sites. Uh, this is tech support. We're, we're, I'm starting the live stream. Thank you. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks. I'm trying to be professional here. You are always professional, chairman. Um, who do we have here? I think everybody's. Uh, Commissioner Tolliver, has that joined us? Djokovic. Oh, there you are. Hey, Gabby. Hello. Okay, I think we're missing uh, Commissioner Cox and Commissioner Tolliver right now. But it is 1245, so we'll start and hopefully they'll join in pretty quick. Uh, so we'll call the meeting to order. I'm going to give the, uh, to the roll call of commission members. And uh, after I call your name, if you could um, reply here or present uh, and confirm that you can see or hear me. Um, hi, Commissioner Cox, good to see you. Um, Commissioner Aguirre. Uh, present, I can hear you and see you. Commissioner Hughes. Present, I can hear and see you. Fantastic. Uh, Commissioner Osmond. Present, I can see and hear you. Commissioner Cox. I can hear you and see you. Uh, Commissioner Djekovic. I can hear and see you, present. Commissioner Burns. Present, I can hear and see you. Commissioner Ponce. Present, I can hear and see you. And Commissioner Tolliver. Not yet here, okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Last year, Governor Pritzker signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings uh, during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions that is that I, as head of the commission on uh, Chicago Landmarks, determined that in in-person meeting of the Commission of Chicago Landmarks and its permit review committee are not practical or prudent. I wanna make sure our virtual meeting meets all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act, Act as amended. Therefore, I'm making a determination pursuant to section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of this Commission on Chicago Landmarks and its permit review committee is not practical or prudent. Similarly, I am making a determination pursuant to section 7E5, that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Commission of Chicago Landmarks or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place for either meeting um, pursuant to a resolution adopted by the Commission of Chicago Landmarks on June 4th, 2020, regarding the chairman's emergency rule making powers. I issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and provisions for remote public participation, effective uh, January 19th, 2021. These rules were posted on the commission's website. In line with those, in line with those emergency rules, today's co regular commission meeting is a virtual meeting being simulcast to the general public via live streaming. Commission meetings have been held virtually since May of last year. Meetings are structured to minimize chances for technical difficulties. Members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written statements in advance of the meeting and those, uh, and these have been posted on the commission's website and are available for public view during the virtual meeting at www.chicago.gov slash CCL. Members of the public desired, desiring to speak at today's, today's meeting were required to register before the meeting and verbal statements by the public for all agenda items will take place at the beginning of the meeting. Applicants and the representatives, as well as aldermen, were asked to contact staff if they desired to speak, and they will be able to do so after the staff presentation on a specific project. 
One member of the general public signed up to speak as, the de as of the deadline of 12.45 p.m. on Tuesday, May 4th, and was provided instructions regarding how to do so. I'd like to call upon him now. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Begin by sitting your name and association you represent, if any, for the record. Ward Miller, you signed up to speak on the agenda item number two, the DPD report for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. And if we can hear from you now. Yes, uh, 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 Chairman Wong, can you hear me clearly? We sure can, thank you. Okay. Sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Wong and members of the commission. I'm Ward Miller, Executive Director of Preservation Chicago. We at Preservation Chicago fully support the Chicago landmark designation of the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House, located at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street on Chicago's near west side. This is a fine quality building of great craftsmanship and design and constructed in anticipation of the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. Its overall composition and quality of detailing are outstanding. And this is an exemplary example of a Schlitz Brewery Tide House, as well as being a fine quality neighborhood commercial building. The Schlitz Lake Street Brewery Tide House building was also known for about 20 years as the La Luce restaurant. It's a highly visible, res it's a highly visible structure, lovely in appearance, and is seen for many blocks as one proceeds northward on Ogden Avenue to Lake Street. Its magnificent use of rich materials in red brick, limestone, ornamental copper bays and corner turret make it a much admired building and part of the Ogden Avenue, Lake Street and near west side built environment and view shed. Uh, the Schlitz Brewing Tide House was surveyed as part of the near west side community area um, in December 1984, and it was determined at that time, some 37 years ago, to be orange rated and a building of great significance listed in the Chicago Historic Resources Survey, which itself was published 25 years ago by the city of Chicago. Therefore, the significance of the building has been recognized by both the general public and the city for decades, and its, and its importance to Chicago's built environment has only increased over almost 40 years. The public outcry associated with the building's possible dem demise and demolition led us to start a very nicely worded change.org petition to encourage preservation of the building and consideration of the building uh, as a designated landmark. That resulted in a tremendous response from the general public, unlike anything we had encountered uh, to date, resulting in over 8,000 petition signatures spanning over 366 pages and continues uh, to grow. And we just want to encourage uh, the, the department and the city to continue forth with the landmark designation. And we're grateful for this consideration, uh, for the consideration of this building to be a designated Chicago landmark. So therefore we at Preservation Chicago are in full support of this uh, Chicago landmark designation and report from the city of Chicago. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ward. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, nobody else has signed up to speak. Uh, so we will go through the agenda. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. That meeting took place um, on April 1st, 2021. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes. So moved, Commissioner Osmond. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Aguirre. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Aguirre. Uh, I will go do the roll call uh, for approval. Commissioner Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Tolliver. Uh, so that are here. Uh, Commissioner Cox. Yes, here. Commissioner yes. Jakovich. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Burns. Commissioner Burns. Uh, yes. Sorry about that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Ponce. Yes. And I vote yes as well. Uh, the motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the report uh, regarding the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House that we just spoke about. Uh, at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. This is in the 27th Ward. 
and Commissioner Cox, uh, please let us know what's going on here. Um, I guess the, um, I'm, I, um, I'm going to narrate uh, the slides. Uh, uh, whoever is um, controlling the slides, I guess we'll know when to uh, move it forward. But uh, this is the summary report uh, to the Commission on Chicago Landmarks on the former Schlitz Bury Tide House. Um, the former Schlitz um, Bury Tide House is located at 1393-1399 West Lake Street. Uh, it was built in 1892 for the Joseph Schlitz Bury Company. Uh, it's one of the earlier and more architecturally ornate examples of the Chicago taverns built by breweries. The former Tide House is in the near west side community area in the 27th Ward. The structure was orange rated as determined by the Chicago Historic Resources Survey. A uh, Fulton Market Innovation District Plan was initially adopted by the Chicago Plan Commission in 2014 uh, for the area roughly bounded by uh, Hubbard Street, uh, Holstead Street, uh, Randolph Street, uh, and Ogden Avenue. Um, it's consisted of a uh, land use map, general design line, uh, guidelines, uh, a suite of public investments, and recommendations for preserving uh, historic buildings. Expanding several blocks beyond uh, those boundaries in 2017, the Plan Commission also adopted the uh, West Loop uh, design guidelines, which contain general strategies for design excellence, including preserving and integrating adjacent and on-site historic buildings in a complementary manner uh, into new developments. Tremendous land use and market demand changes in and around the Fulton Market Innovation District since the initial 2014 plan uh, have prompted an update, which uh, was approved by the Plan Commission in February of 2021. One of three main goals identified in the updated plan was to protect and enhance historical and cultural assets by continuing to support the Fulton um, Randolph Market <laughs> Landmark District and other historic assets. Therefore, the Department of Planning and Development finds that the proposed landmark designation of the former Schlitz Brewery uh, Tide House at 1393 1399 West Lake Street supports the city's overall planning goals for the surrounding near west side community area and the central planning region uh, and is consistent with the city's governing policies uh, and plans. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Is there any uh, questions uh, regarding this item from the commission? Um, having none, uh, I'd like to request a motion to accept the department's report for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. Is there a motion? Motion. Uh, who is Jacob. that, sir? Commissioner uh, Jacobitz. Commissioner Jacobitz, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Hughes is a second. I will do the roll call. Uh, Commissioner Aguirre? Uh, yes. Commissioner Tolliver? Yes. And, and welcome. Uh, Commissioner Osmond? Yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Burns? Yes. Commissioner Ponce? Yes. And I am a yes as well. The, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you.
Uh, the next item on the agenda is a citywide adopt a landmark fund. This is uh, uh, for the property, uh, the Longwood Drive District, um, 10244 South Longwood Drive in the 19th Ward. Uh, there's no resolution for the commissioner for this agenda. Uh, it is informational only. So, uh, Matt, could you let us know what's going on with this? Looks like, Thank you, uh, Chairman Wong. Can you hear Game me? Game of Thrones piece. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. We sure can. Great. So in March 2020, uh, you, your commission awarded Adopt the Landmark funds to Beverly Unitarian Church to undertake an exterior envelope restoration of their property, which is known as Givens Castle. It's in the Longwood Drive Chicago Landmark District. They were awarded $240,000 of Adopt the Landmark funds for a total project budget, budget of $724,000. I'm here to, today to inform you that the project has been completed successfully in accordance with, with the requirements of the adopt a landmark fund. The project scope of work and budget which you reviewed in March 2020 the landmark agreement and the commission's guidelines. For orientation Gibbons Castle is located in Longwood Drive district which was designated in 1981 consists of 12 residential blocks on Longwood Drive that, that began to be developed in the 1870s as a suburban type development. Perhaps the most prominent building in the district, Gibbons Castle was built in 1886 as a home for developer Robert Gibbons and his family. Following a trip to the west of Ireland, Gibbons designed his home to re resemble the castles found there. In, 1940s, in the 1940s, the building became home to the Beverly Unitarian Church, which continues its stewardship today. The Adopt the Landmark funds were used to conduct critical repairs to the exterior envelope of the building to address long-term water infiltration. This included complete replacement of the roof and drainage systems and parapet repointing. The scope also included critical masonry repairs to the three Joliet limestone turrets shown in the roof plan. These exhibited displaced and cracked stone, water infiltration, and deteriorated mortar. All three were strapped with steel banding and mesh prior to the start of the restoration project. The turret scope of work required dismantling approximately five to 10 feet of the upper portion of each turret wall. You applied conditions of approval for this work that the applicant has followed. These included cataloging each stone with a number keyed to drawing showing the location of the stone for proper reinstallation. While most of the stone was salvaged, about 30% of the turret units were too deteriorated and had to be replaced. Lannan stone was used as a replacement for the wall field. For stones with molded profiles, Texas Silverdale was employed for its machinability. Samples of these replacement stones were, were reviewed and approved by staff prior to installation. This slide shows the, pro the projected budget that you approved in March, 2020 with the final figures at the right hand of the column. In green, the final budget for the project includes the $240,000 grant from the Adopt a Landmark Fund that you approved in March 2020. The total project cost was originally estimated at $720,669, with the final cost being slightly lower by $3,755. The original estimate for soft costs was high at $77,000. Only approximately 63% of this was needed. The remaining 28,000 from this line item was used for hard costs. To conclude, the grant funded rehabilitation has been completed in compliance with what you reviewed and approved. The restoration has addressed long-term water infiltration and masonry distress that will ensure the building continues to serve as a treasured landmark and a community resource for the church's programs. The project is located in the 19th Ward and Alderman O'Shea has submitted a letter of support. Representatives of the owner and the architect are here. If you have any questions, I'm also available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. 
Um, does the commission have any questions for Matt regarding this? Um, I, I had a real quick question. Uh, so the church is using it for their programs currently, is that? That's right. They use it as a house of worship, but they also conduct a number of um, programs for the community from, from this building. Um, they've been there since the 40s, so they have a, a long-term commitment to the building. And one of the things that you know we, we pointed out and when we first saw the project is that they have a lot of community support as well as congregational support that funded um, this project in addition to the adopt a landmark funds. That's wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Um, next item on the agenda is uh, the citywide adopt a landmark fund. Also, uh, the 2021 funding priorities and evaluation criteria. Uh, this is going to be voted on. And uh, Diana, if you could uh, present. Uh, this agenda item. Hello, commissioners. Um, so as you may know, citywide adopt a landmark program funds are generated by the neighborhood opportunity bonus. The neighborhood opportunity bonus established in 2016 offers increased development rights in downtown zoning districts in exchange for payments to the three neighborhood opportunity bonus funds. 80% of the funds are allocated to the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, 10% of the funds go to the Local Impact Fund, and 10% to the Adopt a Landmark Fund. To be considered for funding, Adopt a Landmark projects must be consistent with the landmark guidelines. The Commission must approve individual project scopes and budgets, and funds must be used for substantial interior or exterior renovation work that is visible from a public street or within a portion that is open to public. Projects needing adopt a landmark fund grants over 250,000 will require approval of the city council and must comply with the city's MBE, WBE and local hiring requirements, as well as applicable Illinois prevailing wage requirements. As stated in the Municipal Code, the Department of Planning and Development will give priority to projects that have not been completed and that address exterior envelope issues. The Department may also establish other funding priorities by rule. The Department has established a new funding priority for 2021, which is being presented today. Before discussing the new funding priority and evaluation criteria, however, I wanted to provide a brief status update regarding the citywide adopt a landmark fund from 2017 to 2020. In 2017, the commission approved a list of funding priorities established by DPD and the first funding application round under the new bonus regulations was announced at the June 2017 commission meeting. At that time, approximately $478,000 had been deposited into the Adopt a Landmark Fund. Two projects were selected from the applications received in 2017. The same list of funding pri priorities established in 2017 was used to evaluate the applications received in 2019 as part of that year's application round. In 2020, a new funding priority for small direct adopt a landmark fund grants was established to participate in the Together Now Fund. This year, DPD has established a new funding priority, neighborhood anchors and neighborhood commercial buildings. These types of buildings will be targeted for the positive stabilizing role they play in so many neighborhoods as well as promoting pedestrian activity, small business establishments and local commerce. The buildings could be either individually designated Chicago landmarks or contributing buildings within designated Chicago landmark districts. A neighborhood anchor landmark building is a center or an aspiring center of community life. It can be a gathering place for residents of a neighborhood either formally through, for example, the provision of program social services or religious events or informally through spontaneous gatherings. Some examples of neighborhood anchor landmark buildings include institutions, 
legacy businesses, field houses, restaurants, religious buildings, and similar social gathering places. Neighborhood commercial landmark buildings are generally small scale commercial buildings and or mixed use buildings with residential uses on upper floors and ground floor retail commercial uses. In addition to the neighborhood anchors and neighborhood commercial buildings priority, this year's grant applications will be evaluated based on how many of the following criteria are met. The first two of the seven criteria include projects that have not been completed and that address exterior envelope issues, projects that are located within qualified investment areas with priority to projects that are also in the invest Southwest community areas. Qualified investment areas are areas designated as low to moderate income areas as determined by census data. A map of qualified investment areas is published and will be updated at least once every five years. The next two of the seven criteria include projects that leverage additional project investment such that the requested adopt a landmark funds fill financing gaps and projects that will have a positive catalytic impact on the community in which they are located. The impact may be in the form of new permanent jobs created, commercial leasing to new businesses, providing new services such as soup kitchens, education training, after school programs, childcare services, and others. And the last three of the seven criteria include projects that address prevent further deterioration of the subject property's structural and architectural integrity caused by natural misfortunes such as storm damage, fire, flooding, et cetera, or buildings that are situationally threatened as determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Projects that will rehabilitate vacant or underutilized buildings to make them ready for occupancy or improve their occupancy. This may include an interior and exterior scope of work with adopt a landmark funds to be used for qualified exterior work. Projects that are shovel ready and will be completed in two years. Applications submitted to the department will be reviewed for completeness and compliance with the funding priority and evaluation criteria. Qualified projects pending availability of funds that meet the funding priority and the greatest number of evaluation criteria will be presented to the Commission for review and approval of the proposed project scope of work and associated budget. Once a project is approved, the property owner receiving the funds must enter into an agreement with the City and the Commission on Chicago Landmarks regarding the manner in which the funds will be used. Any funds that have not been used upon completion of the restoration project shall be returned to the citywide adopt a landmark fund. At this time, the department recommends that the commission approve this 2021 funding priority and evaluation criteria. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, does the commission have any questions for Deanna regarding this uh, funding priority in the this is 2021 funding. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, I think this is for you, Deanna, but if someone else is more appropriate, I'm curious about how um, potential properties that could apply for Adopt the Landmarks Fund that at present are residences. So, for example, um, the Tillman Mobley House and the Muddy Waters House. Um, but they have the potential of becoming a neighborhood anchor. Is the fact that they're residential properties at present any hindrance to their applying or being prioritized? So I, yes, I can answer that. So because these would be projects that would um, technically convert the property into a different use, they would qualify. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I have a- Yes, Commissioner Osmond, please. Uh, does this include roof it, roofs? Uh, as exterior work, yes, it would yes, qualify it can. for, for okay, the good. fund. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? 
Yeah, I do. Um, yes, please. Commissioner Aguirre, um, here. Uh, thank you, Diana. This was very helpful. I, I'm really excited to see the alignment of all this uh, public investment policies just now in um, overlaid with uh, with landmarks. Quick question about um, outreach. How um, do you envision um, there's there's um, it's a high number of properties or landmarks um, that are in this territory uh, showcase in the map? How do you anticipate um, letting um, property owners know that this is they are now in a in a priority zone uh, or or qualify for this so we are planning a number of um, initiatives on how to reach um, the property owners um, including the new application as well as a website will be updated on our on the commission website we will we reach out via um, uh, various um, news um, um, articles, um, we will have events, we will uh, reach out via the um, regional planners who are in touch with various property owners. We will contact all our aldermanic offices. Um, we will reach out to chambers of commerce. And so there, there is a, a, a menu of ways that we are um, going to be um, making sure that folks are aware of this program. Thank you. I am really thrilled to hear that. I, I think it's just, you know, the best, the best that we can do um, socializing this information with all these communities. And I know there's a lot of planning efforts um, in multiple neighborhoods. So the more that we embed, you know, the alignment of this funding opportunity uh, for existing um, stock of buildings, spe specifically landmark, um, I think would be would be of great um, a great opportunity to use those um, planning efforts to also to let the public know this is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gary. Any other questions? I, I did want to kind of follow up and Commissioner Gary. Oh, There's Commissioner Hughes. Hands. Thank there you. Hands. I'm sorry. Are we using our raise hand function? Uh, you know, uh, I do. Yes, I will. Hang on. <laughs> no worries. Yes. No worries, Chairman. Um, I um, I want to second uh, Commissioner Gary's comments on just commending commending this group for being much more inclusive with who can qualify for this type of funding. Um, obviously, I saw the the muddy house and the the Emmett Hill. Um, home as examples, which before would not qualify. So, so I'm really, really excited to see the expanded kind of network of, of people that can apply for this and properties that can apply. Um, I also want to understand a little bit more, there's this heavy, heavy emphasis on exterior, but I know some of these projects will become museums and will become these kind of interior spaces that need to be maintained as well. So is there support there for that as well, uh, Deanna, or support somewhere else that these um, property owners can apply for. So the, the code does allow for exterior work, obviously, but interior work that's open to public can qualify as well. Okay, that's, that's great to hear. I'm excited about this as well. Um, and hopefully there's a way on the out, outreach portion, hopefully there's a way to just contact those, the, the you know, landmark property owners directly, whether it's with a mailer or, you know, just making sure their <laughs> automatic offices contact them directly to make sure, to ensure that they, they understand these uh, benefits out there available for them. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Cox. Great, uh, so you can see the hand. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Thank you, uh, Chairman Wong. I, I did want to frame a couple of things that the other commissioners have highlighted. Um, I, I too want to compliment the preservation staff in really responding to um, the ever-changing um, um, sense of buildings that have uh, kind of uh, that are iconic, that are neighborhood-based, uh, and that are landmarked. Uh, some that um, this body has landmarked. Uh, and others that were established landmarks, but perhaps uh, the owners didn't know that they had access to uh, these funds. 
So um, I hope in the end that it will be um, an incentive for more buildings that are worthy of uh, landmark status to come forward um, to get their buildings landmarked so that they can access uh, these resources. Uh, there's another trend that you're seeing uh, as the city has been focusing a lot of attention on the commercial corridors in neighborhoods. Uh, often when we ask residents, what are the buildings uh, that you love in your neighborhood that you would like to see adaptively reused? Very, very often they point to buildings that are landmark and they don't even know that they're landmark. They just know that those are the buildings that they are proud of in their community and that could be brought back. And so um, now we are able to um, put the adopt the landmark as a part of the incentives package into the Invest Southwest um, request for developer proposals. So you see buildings like the Laramie Bank um, or Pioneer Bank, um, um, both that are privately owned, um, being able to access the Adopt the Landmark funds. And so we advertise that as one of the incentive options that developers have as they try to put together a uh, competitive stack. At the same time, you see other buildings like the um, Inglewood Fire Station, which is publicly owned, will also have access, but Landmark will also have access to uh, adopt the Landmark funds. Uh, but I think as Commissioner Hughes said, the, one of the real um, finds here is that houses that have uh, historical significance because of association with uh, an individual or an events um, can now qualify for these funds. So it's my hope that um, we will see an expanded um, group of property owners step forward uh, to use these resources and that you know buildings that are on commercial streets that are you know mercantile buildings like banks um, will be restored. Uh, as a result of these funds. So uh, I'm just, I'm, ex I'm excited uh, as you are to kind of expand the reach of these resources and just thank, thanks to the staff for their, their willingness to, um, to kind of do a refresh uh, and promote heavily um, this, this resource that folks have uh, on the west side, the south side in those qualifying areas that were highlighted. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Um, one of the things that I actually wanted to ask about, uh, Diana, is uh, in, in terms of the outreach, and I, I appreciate Commissioner Gary's uh, question uh, about the outreach, um, but I would also encourage uh, reaching out to design professionals as well. So including uh, the AIA and other uh, entities, uh, the, I think there's a historic preservation architects uh, group as well, um, because they have, you know, they certainly have their eye on uh, on places as as well as CAC. Um, but that being said, if the if the application process, uh, in terms of the timing of that, does the application process require architectural drawings to, in order to apply? Because that also takes time as well. So keeping that in mind and how long it will take to at least put together uh, something that is formidable, I guess, when, when that application is put together. If you could respond to that. And yes. uh, Commissioner Osman, I see your hand as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, great points. And yes, we do anticipate giving uh, you know, two months for the application deadlines to be submitted. Um, and we do anticipate that you know, some projects may not have fully developed drawings. And um, as with the previous application round, the department reviewed the applications and gave um, soft commitments with the understanding that uh, fully developed drawings would be needed within a certain period of time. And um, the project then would be brought to the commission when ready. So it does not, it does not um, basically indicate that you have to have everything designed at the time of application. 
But we do need to understand though what the project ask is and what the scope of work is at, you know, so there's a certain minimum of information that will be required. Thank you. Commissioner Osman. With um, the CAC, because we do open house Chicago, we do uh, asset mapping in all the communities. Hence my question about uh, roofs, because so many buildings we end up not being able to go back into or go back into because whether it be the forum, you know, who's doing a raise the roof campaign, there's a lot of structural problems in these buildings. So I'd be happy to work with staff in terms of uh, comparing our lists. I think what we're just getting into is the complexity of the uh, application and um, Commissioner Cox, and we've been working on this with Invest Southwest and Commercial Quarters. If the applications are too complex, we don't get um, people applying. So I just would ask that there be really a handholding staff person that is going to walk somebody through every aspect of it and that we minimize the complexity of it because otherwise these um, applicants can't fulfill um, getting the grant. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Osmond. Commissioner Ponce. Hi, yes, um, um, fellow commissioners, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that has been said and, and I can't wait to see how this uh, unfolds. And, um, you know, adding to what Commissioner Aguirre said with the, with the outreach and what Commissioner Osmond has said, th there's also an, an education component, right? to make sure that um, this program really unfolds the way it should be. So it makes it a, a good experience on all ends. Um, Commissioner Wong, you said you asked a great question about the, the architectural perspective. So these are all elements that education has to be uh, really you know, along the way with this. So um, very excited, equally as excited. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Commissioner Burns. Thank you. Um, I want to, uh, I really appreciated Commissioner Geary's question about outreach. Um, I also, just a comment, um, Deanna, I appreciate your response that the outreach isn't limited to existing properties. I think this is a great opportunity if we're thinking about aldermen, about media, to promote this opportunity to the broader community because there's lots of folks who haven't applied for landmark status that might get more excited about it or see the value knowing that there's financial resources and technical assistance resources through the um, historic preservation division that could be really helpful. And I think the lessons learned from the proposed but ultimately defeated Pilsen Historic District is a great way for the staff and the commission um, to think as broadly as possible, not only about who's eligible now, but who might be eligible in the future and how do we get them excited about this opportunity. So um, I wanna say again, Dion, I so appreciate that the staff is thinking more broadly than only existing sites. Thank you, Commissioner Burns. I do not see any other hands up. Uh, with that, then, I would like to call for a motion um, to accept the 2021 funding priorities in a value and criteria for the citywide adoptable landmark fund. So Is moved. there a motion? So Does Commissioner Hughes move that in the second? Seconded, Commissioner Burns. Thank you. Uh, I'll do the roll call. Commissioner Aguirre. Um, yes. Commissioner Tolliver. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Osmond. Yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Chekovich. Yes. Commissioner Ponce. Yes. And I am a yes also. The uh, motion carries um, unanimously. Uh, that is fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. Next item on the agenda is the Class L property uh, tax incentive, final certification for the Cook County Hospital administration building. This is located at 1835 West Harrison Street in the 27th Ward and chairman. unbelievable project. And Deanna, uh, Chairman, sorry, I uh, have to yes, recuse myself Hughes. for this one. Okay, thank okay. you, Commissioner Hughes. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, certification of the scope of work and budget for Class L project is the final step by the Commission on Chicago Landmarks to, to administer this incentive. 
This certification would then be used by the building owner to complete their application for the class L tax reduction with the Cook County Assessor. On January 15, 2020, the City Council approved a class L real estate property tax incentive for the Cook County Hospital Administration Building. The eight story building was built in 1912 to 14 and designed by a noted architect, Paul Gerhardt, in the classical revival style. The property was designated a Chicago landmark in 2019. A copy of the class L ordinance and exhibits, as well as the final report from the owner, which documents the completed project was in your packets. The owner has applied uh, for the 20% federal rehabilitation tax credit and has received the part three approval. CHDG phase 1A1 office owner LLC and CHDG Phase 1A1 Hotel Retail Owner LLC have completed the extensive exterior and interior rehabilitation of the building for adaptive reuse as a 210 key dual brand hotel, Hyatt Place and Hyatt House, 24,540 square feet of ground floor retail space, including a food hall, childcare facility, a small museum on the ground floor dedicated to the history of the hospital and over 72,000 square feet of office space for Cook County Health and Hospital Systems. The extensive exterior work included masonry cleaning and terracotta and brick repairs or replacement where required on all elevations. Non-historic infill was removed and windows were replaced to match their historic appearance and existing historic doors were repaired or replaced. Non-historic rooftop enclosures and infill on the south elevation were removed and two portions of a new contemporary and compatible cladding on the south facade were installed. The interior scope of work included restoration of double height lobby and corridor spaces, restoration of lobby stairs, repairs to the exit stairs for code requirement, improvements to the five passenger elevators, and all new electrical plumbing and fire protection systems and mechanical systems. Restoration of the warden's office and reception room on the second floor was completed and two operating theaters on the eighth floor were retained. An application for the lead uh, uh, LEED certification is in process. The initial budget for Class L eligible expenses was just over 112 million. The owner has spent uh, 118.8 million for Class L eligible scope of work, which is 6.7 million more than initially estimated. In total, the owner invested just under 100. 140 million in the project. Staff recommends that the commission certify completion of the class L project. The applicant has also provided a short video that we would like to show now. And then representatives of the owner are here to make a statement following the video and to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. For decades, this was the largest public health facility in North America. When this old building was closed up, it stayed closed and boarded up for 18 years. This was a, a very scary looking building. You literally could not walk through the corridor without touching lead paint that had curled off the wall. Five layers of ceilings were down on the ground. You were not walking on the ground, you were walking on 1913 construction, 1940 construction, 1970 construction. It looked like a scene from a horror movie. It was ready for demolition. We've got the opportunity to rebuild that community. It's called Harrison Square. We hope to build approximately 3 million square feet of space. 
When we put up our construction fences and started this project, you could just feel the life coming back into this neighborhood. Just seeing the building under construction has just been a great thing for the area. We're ordering approximately 4,000 pieces of terracotta. My goal on this project is to fully restore all the terracotta that has been removed or has been damaged and to make it blend in so that it never looked like we touched the facade at all. This is the progress you're really going to see and notice. The training, the quality is absolutely world class. We're like family. I had my son here in 1989. Being born here on the fifth floor of the paternity ward, God is blessing you to come back again 52 years later. You're going to see an energy level brought to this location that's not been seen since the building opened originally at the turn of the century. To renovate a building like this is really to touch a part of history. Cook County is one of the largest and most ornate examples of classical revival public building in the city. There were so many times that people thought it was coming down. To see it be saved and rehabilitated is always gratifying. I'm actually going to come here and stay in one of the rooms just because, you know, I helped build this. There'll be apartment buildings, there'll be condominium buildings, grocery stores, commercial spaces. We're going to look to employ thousands of people over the next 10 years. To be a brick in the building, be a part of the building for the next so many years, 100 years, will be a blessing. Wow, thank you. That was, that was exciting. Uh, the applicant is here, uh, if you'd like to make a comment. Uh, Bridget, I think uh, you're representing. We are Good thrilled to, to be you. here, Mr. Chairman. Nice to see you all too. This is a very exciting day um, to present this project for final certification to the Landmark Commission. Um, we have the team that helped make it happen here today to just make a brief statement. Patricia Eloisi, who's Chief Operating Officer with MBE Real Estate is here on behalf of the development team. We have Ken Johnston, who you saw on the video with Walsh Construction. He was the Senior Project Management. And um, we have Ian Johnston um, on, the, on the team. He was with SOM and the architect. So I'd like to turn it over to Patricia to make a short statement on behalf of the development team. Thanks, Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. Chairman Wong, uh, commissioners and staff, um, this is a joyous day for all of us. I, when I see that video, each time I get welled up with tears. Um, um, I want to thank the Landmark Commission, the Department of Planning and Development, Alderman Burnett, um, everyone with, within the city of Chicago um, for making, helping us to make this project a reality. Um, we are thrilled with how the project turned out. It is beyond um, my wildest imagination. I will tell you that when I started this project, my hair was brown and it is not brown anymore. I have grayed out as a result of it, but it was well worth it. Um, we um, want to thank the, the commission and, this, and the excellent staff uh, in helping us on this project uh, and advancing um, the, the restoration and integrity of this amazing building. Um, this building transforms not only the um, near west side, but it also transformed all of us that worked on it. Um, the businesses that operate in the area, the hospital systems, um, but it's also a beacon for the future. It's a bright light, and it really is um, something that we hope that everyone in the city appreciates. Um, we'll advance um, the post-COVID recovery, especially in life sciences, in connection with um, the, the area. This is this ground point zero for medical and life sciences in Chicago. Um, it's transformational for sure. Um, right now I'm sitting in the boardroom uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the Hyatt Hotel and just down the hall from me um, is a hooding ceremony for um, UIC's medical school. And uh, to see this enlivened and graduates of the medical school walking through the halls is um, spectacular. 
Um, I, I just can't thank you enough. And I so much appreciate the leadership, not only of the city of Chicago, but also our partner, Cook County and uh, President Preckwinkle. Um, a million thanks. Um, a million lives have passed through here and hopefully millions more um, will benefit from this project. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but I have goosebumps when I speak about this project and it's one of the most, it's, I, I am so proud. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, was there somebody else that wanted to speak? Hey, Mr. Chairman, can I make one more point? I, yes, I really please. can't let this, this pass without also thanking Landmark Illinois and Preservation Chicago, yes. who were such key partners in saving this building um, when it was threatened with demolition. And so we would like to also offer our kudos to their involvement. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, uh, and Bridget, for the record, uh, and I forgot to ask you to do this, if you could announce who you are <laughs> and who you <laughs> represent. <laughs> sure. Um, my name is Bridget O'Keefe. I'm a partner with Daspin and Ament, and I'm here on behalf of the uh, dual applicants for the Class L property tax incentive. Thank you. Uh, and there was uh, nobody else uh, from the team to speak? I think Ken um, Johnston and... Um, Ian Kaminsky are here if you have any questions. We'd be happy okay. to answer any questions you might have about the development project or the importance of the Class L to the um, financial structure that allowed okay. this project go forward. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, does the commission have any questions of the applicant or uh, staff regarding this? And I am looking for the hands. Uh, Commissioner Burns, let's start with you. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Wong. Just a heartfelt congratulations. This project exemplifies everything that's amazing about historic preservation, about partnerships, about public and private working together. Um, congratulations to the staff and historic preservation. Um, this is a, a wonderful moment and I think a project of national significance. So um, all the best to, you have so much to be proud of. Thank you, Commissioner Burns. Commissioner Cox. Yes, I, I too, uh, I too was, uh, you know, uh, swelling up uh, as I watched this video <laughs> and hearing uh, the young man talk about being born there and then 50 years later coming back to be a part of its restoration. That's really what's going on. It's a very, very big accomplishment. Um, my, my compliments to all of you, all of those who, who persevered, because uh, this is a very big building, an enormous undertaking. Uh, and it, you know, I, I, it exemplifies everything we've been talking about in terms of these iconic buildings that you can see from far uh, away and they've touched the lives of thousands of people. And it means so much uh, that um, the group that put this together um, has restored it for, for many, 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 many generations uh, to come. So uh, just kudos. I, I do think that uh, a lot of times the significance of the Class L um, gets lost in how important it is in terms of how you've structured uh, the finances. So it would it would be worth spending a moment to talk about the significance of the Class L and what makes this uh, possible moving forward. Because every one of these we we have to kind of defend um, that they are uh, integral to the success of the project. And so it's just helpful for all of us to know just what that means so that, you know, we can defend uh, these and make sure that they continue to be applied uh, in the places of greatest, greatest need. So just a moment about the Class L, how, how it fits into the larger picture of what you've just delivered. Uh, Bridget, do you want to take that on? I'm sure I can. Or Patricia, would you like to, or would you like to? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. You know, the Class L, um, was essential to the financial success of this project. This was a really difficult project to do, which is why it didn't happen for so many years. And if and I can honestly say that if it wasn't for a combination of the historic tax credits and the Class L, this project would not have happened. As you can see, the project budget, even as careful as everyone was, went up in cost um, from when they started to when it was completed. 
um, there was an additional 6.7 million in unanticipated costs, which often occur, you know, when you take down the walls, particularly when the walls were in the condition they were with the hospital. Um, it, it really did result in unexpected costs and the class L is going to help make the project a reality. I cannot say um, lightly enough that this project wouldn't be happening if this incentive hadn't been a key component. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, Commissioner Osmond. Yes, I wanted to say, thank, extend the thank you. Uh, Bridget talked about uh, some of the preservation movements, but I really want to thank uh, Cook County President uh, Tony Pretwinkle. She asked us to run a design charrette, and it really is the design community of Chicago that participated in the design charrette, came up with some wonderful ideas, and really demonstrated why it should not be torn down. And if we had not had that initial participation of the design community showing what could be done, I don't think we would have seen it happen. So I think John Murphy really stepped up, but I'd like to thank the design community for really um, showing imagination. Thank you, Commissioner Osmond. Commissioner Jekovic. I just wanna say that um, this, pro this is an incredible project and uh, to see how far it's come um, and, and really the monumental task that it was to bring this restoration um, from point A to point B. It's a tremendous project for the city and um, it shows that anything's possible. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone that was involved and, and fought to make this happen. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Geary. I just wanna echo everyone's um, and it's impressive work. So you all should feel very proud. Um, of this endeavor, it's it's. I'm always really nervous to see um, publicly, formerly publicly owned buildings going into transforming into their new life and becoming private assets, right? But this definitely becomes um, not only a, a piece of history of Chicago uh, for lots of generations, um, but also the new life that you have uh, enabled in it, and the new generations that will get to learn about what happened there before. It's just really impressive, um, the, the care and, and craftsmanship and, and all the impressive energy that was poured into this, the completion of this project. So impressive work. Thanks for your commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Geary. Uh, I have not seen any more hands up. I did wanna also add uh, myself personally, my mother taught pathology at UIC's medical school for 35 years. And so uh, I have seen this building uh, many times uh, of growing up and to see it now is just spectacular. And I am so amazed by it. And um, the architects received uh, Chicagoans of the year from the Chicago Tribune for this project. I'm so proud of them as well. Uh, so kudos to everybody. This team was amazing and uh, we will take a vote um, I'd like to request. Wong, I think is uh, yes. Commissioner Ponce's hands up. Oh, yes. Commissioner thank Ponce, you. thank you. Uh, yeah, how could I not share in this excitement too? <laughs> I mean, it, um, you know, driving, driving, seeing it before it was closed down, then driving and seeing it just sit there, and following the story of the whole development. Uh, again, congratulations for breathing life into this anchor uh, this corner or this corridor of Ogden um, bringing life to it and can't wait to see um, it, it is a, a great project on a national scale for people to just follow and be very proud of congratulations thank you commissioner Ponce okay if I haven't missed anybody please speak up now okay uh, so I'd like to request a motion that the commission certifies that the project has been substantially completed in accordance with the approved ordinance and meets the eligibility requirements for the class L incentive for the Cook County Hospital Administration Building. Do I have a motion? So moved, Commissioner Jacobich. Second. Thank you. Second. And a second. 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 Uh, Commissioner Tolliver seconds. I will do the roll call. Uh, Commissioner Aguirre. Yes. Commissioner Hughes. Mr. Hughes. I think she recused uh, herself. Oh, Chairman. she did. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Osmond. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Cox. Yes. 
Commissioner Jacob, uh, wait a minute, you moved, right? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Burns. Yes. Commissioner Ponce. Yes. And I am a yes as well. The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, folks. Thank this you. is thank you so much. Thank amazing. You. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let's see more of these. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so too. Come visit us. Yeah, we yeah. sure will. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Class L property tax incentive final certification for the Essex Inn at 800 South Michigan Avenue, Ward, uh, in the fourth ward. And I believe, uh, Commissioner Osmond, you are recusing yourself on this. And, um, hang on. Uh, Commissioner Hughes, you're back? Yes, I'm back, thank you. Okay, fantastic, thank you. All right, uh, with that, uh, I think, Deanna, I think you're doing this one. Thank you, Commissioner. The 14-story Essex Inn was built in 1961 and was uh, designed by a noted architectural firm, Epstein and Sons. The owner, Essex Hotel Owner LLC, purchased the building in 2014, and the building was designated as a Chicago landmark in 2017. City Council also approved a Class L real estate property tax incentive for Essex Inn in 2017. A copy of the Class L ordinance and exhibits, as well as the final report from the owner, which documents the completed project was in your packets. The owner has completed the exterior and interior rehabilitation of the building for continued use as a hotel. The exterior scope of work included cleaning and repair of all facades with select exterior glazing replacement to match original materials and finishes, alterations to the ground floor entry and a new vegetative green roof. The extensive interior renovation included reconfigured and remodeled guest rooms and amenity spaces, including a new fitness room, installation and upgrade of mechanical, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, and, prime, and fire protection systems throughout the building, new utility connections, and improvements to meet ADA requirements. The initial budget for Class L eligible expenses was around $20 million. The owner has spent $22.8 million for Class L eligible scope of work which is 2.8 million more than initially estimated. In total, the owner invested 34.8 million in the project. Staff recommends that the commission certify completion of the class L project and a draft recommendation was in your packet. Representatives of the owner are here today to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, does the commission have any questions of Deanna at this time. If not, I'd like to call on uh, uh, Mariah DeGrino, uh, if you have a, your representative for this. For yes, this thank order. you. Hi, thank Mariah. you. How thank are you? you? Good. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, we're excited to be here. Um, thank you for um, reviewing the project with us. This has been uh, quite a journey, uh, but really excited to see the finished pro product here. I'm joined by um, Sar Perui, who's Chief Operating Office, Officer of Oxford, uh, the project developer, uh, as well as Olga Mirkin from Decord, who uh, provided project management services. Um, Sar is available to answer any questions, uh, as well as Olga, um, and to say a few words. Um, at this point, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Sar to just say a few words uh, about the project. Um, and we're here for any questions you might have. Uh, appreciate that, Mariah. Uh, this was, uh, like you said, a, a journey, uh, very complicated uh, project. Uh, and uh, like uh, many other Chicagoans, uh, for years, we've driven uh, past this building and, um, you know, seen the, the, the large sign at the top, a pretty iconic uh, sign that everybody, um, you know, can, can really see from the park and uh, other parts from the city. And, uh, you know, over time, uh, had seen it sort of fall down the food chain a bit in terms of uh, the quality of the interior. So when we had an opportunity to buy it and, uh, and refresh the building, um, we were very excited about that. And, 
you know, it's a Epstein designed uh, mid-century modern building. So, you know, we, we really um, tried to go along with that theme and create, uh, you know, really a, a very much mid-century modern theme on the interior of the building, which you see when you walk into the lobby, um, even to sort of the Eames chairs that we have in most of the standard King rooms. Um, but it was an exciting project and, you know, really excited about how it, uh, how it turned out. And uh, again, appreciate uh, the uh, collaboration uh, with the city and with landmarks. Uh, you know, we have uh, participated in, in several historic preservation projects around the city. It's really a big part of our DNA uh, at Oxford. And, uh, and this was a fantastic work, project to work on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, does any, uh, does the commission members have any questions of the applicant or of Deanna regarding this? Um, I will say that uh, I do see this building every day <laughs> and I'm so glad you got the, the sign lighting fixed because that was driving me crazy throughout the entire yeah. pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it looks the same, that sign when you look at it um, in terms of the design, but it really is a brand new sign with all new, you know, uh, electronics, new light bulbs. We even added some LED strip lighting uh, where we can change the colors, um, you know, depending on the holidays. Uh, so yeah, it's an important landmark sign and we want to preserve it. Well, I, I did see it switching from red to green uh, on a regular basis and it was driving me crazy. Uh, signage is one of those things that this commission takes very seriously. So uh, I think you have it right now and um, everything is, is going very well. Um, Commissioner Hughes. Yeah, we look, we take our colors and our lighting very seriously um, here in the city. So I wanna commend this team for uh, just going the extra mile in effort. I know a lot of those old signs are just obsolete in their technology and, you know, the types of bolts that they use and stuff. And so, you know, this was, this is a great example of how you pay homage to the sign that was there, um, but upgrading the technology to, to bring it into today's times. So kudos to you guys. Appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Cox. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is starting to feel like a, a, a real feel good commission meeting uh, where hospitality is carrying the day and saying how uh, optimistic they are about the future, <laughs> that uh, your guests will be coming back uh, and that these were kind of critical, critical investments that uh, I think I feel very optimistic, very hopeful as a result of it. And I can't think of a better use of the class L. I also love uh, going from the kind of ornate beginning of the 20th century um, uh, building to a mid 20th century modern uh, with its, its signage and, and understanding the difference, but also understanding that they both have a, a real place in uh, the kind of historic fabric of the city. So just thank you again for caring about this period uh, of, uh, of architecture in, in Chicago and your willingness to put the investment in and uh, so I'm thrilled that the city can be a partner in this small way with the Class L um, allocation. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Uh, nobody else has raised their hand. So therefore I would like to request a motion that the commission certifies that the project has been substantially completed in accordance with the approved ordinance and meets the eligibility requirements for the Class L incentive for the Essex Inn. Do I have a motion? So moved uh, by Commissioner Cox. Okay, and a second. Second, second. Commissioner, Commissioner Gary. Gary. Uh, Commissioner Gary. Uh, second set, I will do the roll call. Commissioner Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Tolliver. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Djokovic. Yes. Commissioner Burns. Yes, and congratulations. Thank you. Commissioner Ponce. Yes. And I am. Uh, I vote yes as well. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, folks! This is a wonderful project, and uh, look forward to uh, more from you guys. Thanks very much. You bet. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the schedule for a virtual public hearing 
on expedited consideration of the proposed landmark designation and permit application for the demolition of a building pursuant to 2-120-740 through 2-120-825 of the municipal code. This is an announcement only for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. Uh, the public hearing will be held on Wednesday, May 12th, uh, 2021 at 10 a.m. And the hearing officer is Vice Chairman uh, Gabriel Jekovitz. Uh, the public hearing will be held virtually. Details and deadlines for, the part for participation and for viewing the public hearing are available at www.chicago.gov slash CCL. Uh, the last item on the agenda is the permit review committee reports. Um, and I'd like to call on Commissioner Geary for the report, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, the permit review committee reviewed seven projects at its April 1st meeting. And two projects were approved as submitted and five projects were approved with conditions. The report summarizing the scope of the proposed projects and the committee's decisions was included in your packets. Um, this report is for your information and for the record. Thank you, Commissioner Gary. Uh, and then, uh, Larry, if you could give us a report on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the month of March, staff reviewed 182 permit applications. Uh, six of these applications relate to projects reviewed by the Permit Review Committee. A total of 194 reviews were performed by staff. The average number of days to issue the approval or corrections was 2.8 days. Staff also reviewed 19 sign applications during that period. Thank you, Larry. Does anybody have any questions for Larry regarding the permit uh, permits? Okay. Having none, uh, I am going to call for a request to motion uh, motion to adjourn. We are about. I'm to, uh, Commissioner uh, Hughes. Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner, uh, is there a second? Second, Commissioner Burns. Thank you. And all in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> all right, we are adjourned, and the permit review committee will start in. Uh, I want to say ten minutes. Uh, Tech, um, can you confirm 10 minutes is reasonable? Uh, yes, thank you. 10 minutes would be good. Okay, All let's right. resume at uh, 10. I'm uh, sorry, uh, 2 to 10, if that's okay. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good day.